Good evening, I'm Speaker Duncan King from the Northern Michigan Assembly of Reason. Um, this is not my, if you're looking for the Duncan King show kind of video, this is not that. It's more of a shorter vlog. Hopefully I'll try to get it down in maybe 10 minutes. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, or tonight, is the topic of why would they lie? Um, I speak to a lot of Christians about the Bible and I explain to them the various errors, the various flaws in the Gospels. Or when we discuss the claims of why Paul uh, would have claimed that he saw or spoke to Jesus, or the 500 people he uh, claimed spoke to Jesus before him. And I'll, I often get this question from Christians. They ask me, why would they lie? Especially when you talk about a matter of, uh, of Jesus, um, a matter of such strong sentiment. And the gospel stories, which talk so often about truth. And it's a strange thing. They have trouble grasping this idea that a person would lie in order to spread such a story with such sentiments. The question brings me back to my childhood uh, at the Christian school. We used to have... I often say that the, the strongest parts about uh, a church are not uh, quotations of the Gospel story or the Old Testament or the Genesis tale or even apologist explanations for how they think uh, the Bible's true. The most powerful things you hear in church are testimonies about how people were one to Christ, they, their lives were a certain way, they were in, their lives were in shambles, or their life were a wreck, and they found Jesus, and they were saved, and their life was unfixed forever. Yeah. They lived happily ever after. <laughs> um, Nobody lives happily ever after. Well, people live happier, but not happier ever after. That's just how life is. Life's full of ups and downs. Anyway, often you'd find out later that the person who claimed to be... They were conked out on cocaine, or they had this horrible alcoholic problem, and then they found Jesus, and they were all fixed again. That person is exaggerating to a great degree, I found. Uh, what really is happening is, it's sort of similar to when, you know, the before and after pictures that you get when a person, uh, when they give like a diet program, or they give a workout program, they show before and after of a person that that's kind of slovenly a little overweight and the person's all buff often in those photos the per they find uh, an injured athlete of some kind and the person the injured athlete because he's not able to exercise because he's injured is taken out of his natural his normal habitat and then when he his injury ends he's able to go back to his normal routine so this really buff physique is actually the result of the person going back to their normal lifestyle. So that's how they were able to lose 30 pounds in eight weeks. The testimony is true, but in reality they're being they're just going back to their normal lifestyle. Well, the same thing is happening with a lot of these Christians. They give these testimonies about how they were, you know, backslid and they were all drunk and stuff, and they found Jesus. Usually there are people that lived a, a pretty sheltered Christian life. I found, and then during their teenagers. Teenage years, they did a little alcohol or a uh, little drugs, maybe a little pot, as teenagers tend to do. And then as adults, which often is the case, they kind of grew up out of it. And I was the same way. I, you know, drank a little bit and did a few bad things as a teenager on the weekends. And then when I became an adult, I just didn't see a point. And they're, what they will do is they'll exaggerate the story. Now, there's nothing wrong with the fact that a person, that what they're actually doing is they're going back to their, um, they're going back to, to their upbringing. They're actually kind of brought up in a sort of sanitary home life. And then when they grow up, they just go back to that. And there's nothing wrong with being brought up in a sanitary home life. And there's nothing wrong with uh, 
waking up at a certain point and having a strong foundation on um, sober living and going back to that, but what's, what is wrong is them lying about the degree that they were stoned or drunk. And maybe to them, they were extremely stoned and drunk, but <laughs> in my experience, they're just, they're being teenagers. But anyway, uh, one time, you know, we often have people come into church and uh, from traveling people or people from other churches or people from colleges that come into the school or to the church I was in and give testimonies. One day at church, this teenager, well, not a teenager, I mean a young adult, came in. He's about, oh, maybe 22 or so. And he was telling us this story about how he was just conked out on cocaine one night and alcohol and he was stumbling through a city and he wandered into this guy's backyard and there was a pool there and he thought yeah I'm gonna dive in this pool man and he's uh, he stood up on the diving board and he raised his arms out and just as he did that this car drove by and illuminated him and the pool below him in headlights and when he looked down at that moment he was able to see that the pool had about this much water in it and he could see his reflection um, the the shadow or the silhouette of himself there is the cross and he stepped off the pool and he was overcome with Jesus saved him at that moment because if he had died then he would have broken his neck and well just a powerful testimony you know it's a good story <laughs> a few months well a couple years later my family goes to these uh, revival meetings, uh, something we do in the we used to do in the summer. Uh, a modern revival meeting is basically it's four hours of preaching. You, know, you got a preacher here, a preacher here, and then you got maybe some songs, and another preacher, and maybe some songs. Then you take a lunch, and then you come back, and you get another four hours of preaching. So pretty fun for a kid. But I used, you know, I used to go to these things when I was like nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old. Uh, every summer, but one time I was at one of these rival meetings at uh, Northland Christian College, and someone went up there, and it was a couple years after I heard the other story, and told the same story. He was drunk or stoned or on coke. He told it almost verbatim, and he wanders over to the swimming pool in the guy's backyard, puts his arms up, sees the shadow the reflection, and, and was saved, and hallelujah. Totally different guy. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't even believe it at the time, but I tried to put myself in the person's shoes. Whoever, I, I don't know who heard the story first. If it was the, the first guy I heard was the originator of the story, or it was the other guy, or maybe neither of them were the originator. Maybe this story just been circulating around, and people just tell it wherever they think no one else has heard it before. But... It, in their minds, I wonder if they really thought that it was a lie. Because I'm sure that they heard the story and they knew it was a great story. And they knew that the story was inspiring. And they knew that, that the story would do good because it would bring people to the truth as they saw it. So the question comes up, is a lie really a lie if it brings people to the truth? And I think that that's the motive behind most of this dishonest Christian behavior, I found. Because when you are so dogmatic, and you are so certain that your viewpoint, or the way you see things, is the truth, is it really a lie? I would say, of course, yes. But when you're in that mentality, when you're so dogmatic, and you're so certain that you're right, you're so certain that if you convince someone of what you're saying, that it will do good. Will you really see it that way? I don't know. I run Facebook groups, and uh, you know we discuss atheism and Christianity. It's something I'm obviously very interested in. And this summer, a guy came in there, and he had to, he posted this photograph. He said that that he had he was in a dark room. I don't know why he had snapped the photograph in a dark room, but he uh, snapped a photograph in a dark room and uh, 
put the image into his computer and found out that he had taken a photograph of Jesus. The photograph was a little weird looking. It looked kind of like a, like a tie-dye t-shirt or something like that with kind of, you know, like a like a tie-dye version of uh, the the Jesus on toast thing. I kind of thought it looked like that, but um, I didn't really see how it resembled a photograph, but it was, it, I knew that it was nonsense. He posts this on my group, and, he, and everybody's telling, and a bunch of atheists are saying, prove this is a picture of Jesus. It is a picture of Jesus. I took the picture. He keeps saying. So I said, there's just no way this is. So I, I went into Google search, Google image search. Because I, I went, I'd just been in there recently to find a picture of Jesus for a video I was doing. I knew there were a lot of really good paintings of Jesus, and I know that this kind of resembled, that the picture I saw kind of resembled stylistically um, early Middle Ages paintings of Jesus. The style was like that, the way it looked. So I looked through a lot of paintings of, uh, you know, Middle Age paintings of, of Jesus. I think the, the what I typed into the search was something like um, Jesus painting. And it showed up about halfway down the page in the one search I did. It wasn't really even hard to find. And I found a, 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 a pic and put it into an image, into my image editor, and put it right next to the pic he had done. And, uh, you know, lowered the opacity on it and tried to see if it had matched up perfectly. It matched up perfectly. So I present this to them. I hit to this person. I say, "Look, you lied. Uh, you, you're, you, you took this photo and you messed with it, and now you're saying it's a picture of Jesus. So what do you got to say for yourself?" Well, the guy disappears. We never hear him from him again. Recently, uh, today actually, I remember this incident, and I go and look him up uh, on the internet and find his website, and he's still claiming that he this photo is a photo of Jesus. It's some five, six months later, after he was exposed by me. That's just bizarre behavior. And, and I find it so difficult to understand why a person who is searching for the truth, who is trying to examine truth, is trying to put truth out there for people to understand, would lie. And the answer is, someone would do that has no interest in truth. He already thinks he has the truth. So he doesn't really care about any new information or any correct information. It's like I always say, the, the most dangerous thing in this world is dogmatism. Um, like you, you have people who are so certain that they're correct, so certain that their their way of uh, fixing the world will fix the world, will make the world a better place. And a person in that mentality will harm people to achieve some kind of goal. And the same thing goes for the issue of truth. If you're so certain that your worldview is true to such a degree that you won't listen to anybody. That no amount of information will change your mind. Then what does information matter? What does what does the truth? What does an evaluation of information matter? And if an evaluation of information doesn't matter, then then you can lie. You can make up information. Because you you're so convinced that that information will lead people to the truth. I've also had people over the years uh, go in my groups and, and they'll claim to be a scientist. You know, we have some kind of discussion about uh, about some scientific issue. You got, you got to say, I'm right. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a scientist. And I'll ask you some science questions. And you know the answers. There's just some rudimentary science questions. I'm not a scientist. I'm pretty much a layman. But I'm asking them rudimentary high school science questions. They don't know the answers to them. And they're claiming to be scientists. Or I'll say, you know, to really understand this issue, you would need to study psychology. And they'll say, well, I have a psych degree. And I'll ask them some rudimentary psych questions. And they won't know the answers to them. Well, you know, what is the id? What is, who is Piaget? <laughs> they won't know the answers. This is like basic, 
uh, introductory to psychology stuff. You got people like Ray Comfort, who he's been explained it time and time again how the Big Bang works. I have seen him explain it. I've seen him explain the fact that a chimp never gave birth to a human. I've seen it. I've seen people break this down to him. And still again, the next time he goes and has some debate with somebody or something, he'll say, how did a chimp give birth to a person? And straw man the issue again. He knows that that's a straw man. I've seen his, him, people explain this to him. I know he understands it. And that's a form of dishonesty too. When you know that a certain explanation you're giving is faulty, when you've been told and explained how it's faulty, you'll just go ahead and say it anyway. And that is the most common form of dishonesty I encounter with Christians. People who have been explained that this argument they're giving stinks. They've been explained how it stinks. But if they think they can say it to people that don't understand how it stinks, and they can convince them, they'll do it. I I don't understand that. I don't understand why... I don't under... I mean, I understand psychologically what happens, but I don't understand on a personal level that kind of thinking. Doesn't truth matter to you people? Even in the Gospels themselves, you see evidence of dishonesty. I mean, it's apparent in the Gospels. I mean, you talk about Matthew, and I talk about it in my recent video about this. In the end of the genealogy passage in Matthew, Matthew the author of Matthew goes on to say, Thus there were 14 generations in all from David to, uh, from Abraham to David, 14 from the exile, from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And if you look at the genealogy he lists, first of all he got the last part wrong. He, he, could, he didn't even list the number of names he claims to list. The last part he actually lists 13, so there was 14. But in the middle section, the, the middle 14, if you look up in First Chronicles, where he's getting these names, you'll notice that in First Chronicles, it he takes three of the names and just tosses them out. So that if you actually looked at the total amount of names uh, between um, David and the exile, yeah, David and the exile, you will see that there are actually sixteen names there. He takes. Josiah and turns him into Uzziah's father instead of his great-great-grandfather. Which is deliberately dishonest. He had to have known this was a dishonest action. You know, also the issue, uh, you know, and this is proven. There's, it's incontrovertible evidence of dishonest behavior, dishonest mentalities. And you look at, at, at uh, the next thing he does in Micah 5. He talks, it's a, it's a passage that um, he quotes, quotes Micah 5, which talks about Bethlehem, and uses his, his, his evidence that the Messiah came from Bethlehem. And he obviously took the Bethlehem passage and used that to mold his story. But besides, that's besides the point. What he does is, in the Bethlehem passage, the Bethlehem passage is, is about the Messiah freeing the Israelites from the Assyrians. That's what it's about. That's the topic of it. But he takes the passage and just leaves out the part about the Assyrians. Jesus didn't conquer the Assyrians. He couldn't have conquered the Assyrians. At the time Jesus was there, Syria wasn't even a, an aggressive power anymore. They were part of the Roman Empire. And Jesus wasn't a military person. That isn't part of the tale. So the prophecy doesn't fit Jesus. Obviously. When I mean, you read the passage, it's about a person who conquers the Assyrians. That's what that's the whole point of the prophecy as, as it was given. The Israelites were, were being held captive by these army. They were being threatened by this army. And 
the prophet comes forward and says that, you know, this uh, a redeemer will come and he will free us from the Assyrians. And he comes from the clan of Bethlehem. Oh, oh, oh Bethlehem, okay, I'll put that in the Jesus story. But then I'll leave out the part about the Assyrians. Well, that's dishonest. That's not what the prophecy is about. That's deliberately dishonest. You know, it, and you know, Christians even know that this happened. Christians aren't ambivalent of the fact that dishonest behavior, that people would write a Christian writing in with dishonest intent, just because there's the Apocrypha. There's all kinds of fake books in the Bible uh, that were written during that time that didn't make it into the Bible, that Christians reject. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the, Gosp the Apocalypse of Peter, the Infancy Gospels. Christians reject these books because they recognize, I don't know why they reject them, because the there's no more basis for the Gospels they accept than those Gospels, except for the fact that they might have been written a little earlier. But, so they understand, Christians understand, that a person would make up a story. And those those story, those Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary and the Infancy Gospels, they're not written to discredit Christianity. Read them. They're written by honest Christians, as honest as they get anyway, who are trying to spread Christianity, to convince people of Christianity. They're sincere Christians, the authors were. But you think they made them up. You think they lied. So you understand that this happened. You admit that this happened, that this dishonesty happened. I don't know. It's a bizarre situation. Maybe somebody out there has a comment on this. Um, if you have a comment or you have something to ask me, uh, Christian asking an atheist things or just something to comment about, email me at duncanworldmedia at gmail.com. No spaces, no underscores. It's just one thing. Uh, all right, thanks for watching my video.